never be a sweeter story, story of a Savior's love divine. Love that brought him from the realms of glory, just to save a sinful soul like mine. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Oh, wonderful, it is wonderful. Oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful it is to me, to me. Boundless as the universe around me, reaching to the farthest soul away. Saving, keeping love, it was that found me. That is why my heart can truly say, Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Oh, wonderful, it is wonderful. Oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful it is to me, to me. Love beyond our human comprehension. Love of God in Christ, how can it be? This will be my theme and never ending. Great redeeming love of Calvary. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Oh, wonderful, it is wonderful. Oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful it is to me, to me. Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Oh, wonderful, it is wonderful. Oh, isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? Wonderful it is to me, to me. Take your Bible this morning, if you would, please, for our scripture reading to Luke chapter 16, please. Luke chapter 16. We are going to read verses 19 through 31. Verses 19 through 31 of Luke chapter 16. We read the verses responsively. We begin together on verse 19, then I read 20, then together on 21. We alternate reading till we end on verse number 31 of Luke chapter 16. Give me just a little bit more on this one, Dean, if you would, please. And uh, as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing, please, to read God's word. Let's begin on verse 19 of Luke 16. Ready? There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. For the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. Beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Let's pray together, shall we? 
Father, add your blessing, please, to the reading of our scripture here this morning. Father, I'm praying and asking you to make our hearts ready to receive the truth from your word. Thank you for the wonderful music we've enjoyed today. It's been good to sing praises to you. Lord, it's helped us and encouraged us. Lord, I pray that most of all, it's prepared our hearts, that each of us be ready to receive the truth that you have for us today from your word. So, Father, bless the special as it's brought this morning. May we listen carefully. May we ask you to make our hearts good ground that the word of God will fall into and bring forth fruit in our life. Minister to us as only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. would soon be past. Then I saw the Savior through a narrow gate, calling answer quickly before it is too late. Now I am born again, born through Calvary's blood. Child of death, now I'm breathing heaven's breath. Praise the Lord through his blood. I am born again, dying in the shadows, suffering in the night. I could hear Christ pleading. Receive my gift of life. In his hands were nail scars, blood was flowing free. As I knelt before him, his love flowed down to me. Now I am born again, born through Calvary. Blood. Now I'm born again through God's kingdom above. Though I was once a child of death, now I'm breathing heaven's breath through his blood. Praise the Lord, I am born again. Though I was once a child of death, now I'm breathing heaven's breath. Praise the Lord through his blood, I am born again. Amen. Our Father, as we bow our heads in prayer, as we come to look into Your Word this morning, Lord, again, I'm asking for You to walk up and down these aisles and in and out of these rows and minister to every occupied seat. I pray that each of us this morning would give our careful attention to the truth that's before us today. I'm asking you, God, to put a hedge of protection around this auditorium and to bind Satan from this place this morning. That thy Holy Spirit would have free course in every heart and life that's in this room. I pray for those who do not know Christ as their Savior, that the scales would come off their eyes today. They would see their need of a Savior and that Jesus is the Savior they need. 
I need your help as I bring the message and the truth today. And again, God, I trust that you will minister and work in the hearts of the people in this room. May thy will be done in these next few minutes we spend together. In Jesus' name, amen. I want you to help me this morning now. Just a little bit more for me, Dean. And do your best to not move about, not leave unless it's an absolute emergency. I'm going to talk to you this morning on quite possibly the, the most ignored subject in the 21st century church. You can sit in most churches and not hear this subject addressed for years. You can listen on radio or television and not hear preachers or evangelists touch the subject we're going to touch on today. Luke chapter 16 is the only account in the Bible where we have someone who went to hell and tells us about it. The subject we're going to look at today is a subject of hell. And if you in your own mind's eye just think of the years you've been in church and then ask yourself, when's the last time I just heard a message about hell? You, like me, would probably think it's been too long. But hell is referred to 53 times in the New Testament. The reason probably we don't like to speak about it is it's not a very pleasant thought. Some think it's pretty cruel to speak about hell. But I would ask you the question this morning, was it cruel to warn residents of Florida that a hurricane was coming? Would it be cruel to warn a family or wake them out of their sleep if you saw flames coming out of their house in the middle of the night? Is it wrong or is it cruel to mark a bottle of poison in your house with a skull and crossbones? If nothing is cruel or wrong about those things, then it's certainly nothing is cruel or wrong about warning people about hell. There is a place of eternal punishment. A place of eternal torment that awaits people who reject Jesus Christ as their Savior. According to the Pew Research Center's 2014 religious landscape study, 72% of Americans believe in heaven and 58% believe in hell. But when they ask, what is hell like? 48% thought it was a place of suffering and torment. But 46% thought hell not to be a real place, but just an anguished state of existence. 6% said they did not know. Well, if anybody would tell me about hell, I'd like to listen to the one who created it. And that was God. And He tells us about it in His Word. And you may be here this morning and say, well, I just don't believe in hell. Well, then I, you wouldn't be offended if I took God's Word over your Word. Because God knows what He's talking about. And here we have some information, probably a great deal of information about hell in Luke chapter 16. The first thing I want you to notice is the place called hell. The Bible says here in Luke 16, there was a certain rich man, verse 19, that was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom the rich man also died and was buried and in 
hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments. Sometimes people say, well, I'm just living in a hell on earth. And I would say to you, no, you're not. Hell is not on the earth. Hell is in the earth. It's called a furnace of fire in the Bible. It's called a bottomless pit. It's called a place of torment. It's called a place of outer darkness. But it is a real, physical, literal place. Just as sure as there's a place called heaven where God dwells and sits on His throne and Jesus Christ at His right hand, there is an equally opposite place of torment called hell. Several things I want you to notice about this place called hell. Number one, it has real fire. Luke 16 and verse 24, the rich man cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. I'd like you to turn to Mark chapter 9. Keep your finger there in Luke. Mark is the book right before Luke. And look at chapter 9 with me, please. Jesus says, begin in verse number 43 of Mark chapter 9. Verse 43, Mark chapter 9. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter the life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Three times where the worm dieth not, and the Fire is not quenched. There's people in hell this morning that are suffering the torment and the pain of eternal fire. They will not consume, they will not burn up. The man in Luke 16 had eyes to see, he had a tongue with which to speak, he had ears with which to hear. Many of you are aware of what's called phantom pain. Amputees know what that is. They may have lost a leg or lost an arm, but there are times that arm still hurts, even though it's not there. There are times that it itches and they itch, but it's not there. It's called phantom pain, and, and you're going to experience that in hell. It's a place of real fire. Think, oh, it won't bother me. I wish I would have brought some matches with me this morning or a, or a lighter and I could just say, just, just hold your finger in there for a while. Just bring a candle in here and just hold your finger on there for a while. Oh, you may get a few seconds in until you finally pull it away. It's not only a place of fire, it's also a place of absolute darkness. The Bible calls it outer darkness. It's a fearful thing to be in a place where it's so dark you can't see the hand in front of your face. We talked in Sunday school about the plagues in Egypt. One of those plagues was darkness. And it literally says you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. We don't, living in the city, we really don't know what darkness is. Didn't have opportunity last night because of the winds and everything to have the bonfire, but one of the things I remember so well about being out at the farm there, uh, Mrs. Manning, is when it got dark looking up and seeing all the stars. 
that you don't see when you're in Columbus. Uh, too many lights. We don't really, when it's dark, it's not really dark. This is uh, outer darkness, utter darkness. Blackness of darkness as it's described sometimes. In fact, it's described sometimes as chains of darkness that will encompass people in hell. They say when you go into some caverns in the earth and you go by way of the caves, you can reach such a deep darkness if you would pull your finger to your eye, you'd poke yourself in the eye and never see it coming. They say if you stay long enough without any light, you will soon lose control of your coordination and probably fall or faint. But exposed to the deep darkness too long and you will go blind. Imagine in a pit, complete, absolute darkness, falling, for there is no bottom, falling, hearing the screams and the cries of other people. I remember reading about a man who went to a burn unit to visit a fellow who had been burned in a fire. He remembers opening the door and walking in and it was first what he noticed was no lights were on in the room. It was dark. Bandaged, different bandages on people. Some lay there without any bandage. All he heard in that darkness were moans, cries, and screams from those in pain from the burns. And he thought to himself, this must be what hell will sound like. It's a place of utter darkness. But that's not all. A place of real fire. A place of utter darkness. Then the Bible says it's a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping has to do, I think, with your memory and your conscience. Say, what will people be weeping about in hell? They'll be weeping. You'll remember every church service you were in. You'll remember, you'll, you'll remember Jesus Christ died for me. Jesus Christ wanted to save me. I could have had eternal life, but I wouldn't. I didn't. I, I, I wanted to be saved. I just didn't get around to it. And there are people in hell like that. They know all about it. But they never receive Christ as their Savior. Weeping. Abraham said to the rich man, Son, remember. The weeping is going to be over your memories. Your opportunities to receive Christ and you didn't do it. And now, it's eternally too late. Then the Bible says there's gnashing of teeth in hell. Not, not grinding of teeth. You, some of you do that when you sleep at night. That's not what it's talking about here. It's a gnashing of the teeth. And the Bible says there's only two reasons people gnash their teeth. Or the, or the, not, not the Bible. People tell us this and, and, and doctors tell us this. They say you either gnash your teeth out of extreme fear or extreme anger. Now I understand fear. Because if I was in an utter dark place and I'm on fire and I'm in torment, and I have no, no way of getting out, and I'm falling, I never have my feet, I don't regain, and I, I'm, I, I'd be utterly fearful. I, kept, I keep thinking I'm going to hit bottom sometime, and what that, what's that going to be like? You never do, though. I understand the fear, hearing the screams and the cries of people in darkness, and you can't even see. But what about anger? You say, Pastor, are people in hell angry? And the answer is yes, they are. 
angry at themselves for being selfish, angry at themselves for not having received Christ when they had opportunity to, angry at themselves because they chose what they wanted over what God wanted and now it was too late. But they're angry also, I believe, at false teachers and preachers who told them they were okay. Who tell them like many do today, oh, you don't have to worry about hell, or that's not really a real place, or that's just something those old hell, fire, and brimstone preachers made up to make you scared. And they're going to realize that they were lied to and that they weren't told the truth of God's Word. And they're going to be angry at those people and angry at those men that they were lied to. They'll be so angry they'll gnash their teeth. Not only a place of real fire and a place of absolute darkness and a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, but I want you to notice something And back in Luke 16, if you turn there. When the When in hell, the rich man, verse 23, lifted up his eyes, being in torments, he seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. This is perhaps... This another what what you must know about hell is there is no exit. If I had opportunity in hell, if you were in hell and you had opportunity to call out to someone who's outside of hell, my first request would not be to get a tip of uh, his finger in water and touch my tongue. My first request would be, get me out of here. I don't want to be here. Take me out of here. But he couldn't ask to get out because there was no way out. My friend, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. If you do not get saved, you do not have another opportunity. Once you're gone, once this rich man died, he was buried and in hell, he lifted up his eyes immediately. When he died, he immediately went to hell. And there's no exit signs in hell. It's one way and you stay forever. That's the place called hell. But I want to bring to you this morning the people that are in hell. The people that are in hell. If you go to the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21. The last book of the Bible, Revelation 21. Here's a description of people who are in the lake of fire. A description of hell. And the Bible says, but the fearful and unbelieving and abominable murderers, whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone which is the second death. Can I tell you that the people in hell, are, the people who are going to be there are number one, they're ungodly people. You say, what is, what is ungodly? The atheist? The, the one who says no God, no prayer, no Bible, no Ten Commandments, no Christ. I want nothing to do with anything that has to do with God, they'll be there. They'll be there. But I also want you to know moral people will be there. So who will be there? People who paid their bills. People who worked their job. Raised their family. Members of the Lions Club or the Rotary Club or the PTA. But they never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Moral, kind, decent people, but lost 
and in hell. Procrastinators will be there. People who knew they were sinners, they knew that Christ was the Savior. They knew if they placed their faith in Him alone as their Savior, they'd receive eternal life. That they could have their sins forgiven. That their name could be written in heaven. But they listened to the devil's favorite tool. And that is, yes, you need to be saved. Yes, you need to trust Christ your Savior. Just not now. Not now. Not today. Don't do it now. Oh, do it sometime. Do it before you die. But not today. I believe hell has literally millions of people in it who intended to get saved, but waited till it was too late. Last night on her phone, my wife showed me those four sisters that were killed in that limousine accident up in New York. Three of those, they were celebrating the youngest one's birthday, I believe, and three of those other sisters had their husbands in that limousine with them. All of them are in eternity. Do you think when they got in the limousine that day to celebrate sister's birthday, they thought that would be the last day they'd live? You think when they got up that morning, they said, well, this will be the last Saturday we'll ever have on this earth. By, by 12 hours from now, this evening will be in eternity. I pray they knew the Lord as their Savior. If not, they're in hell this morning. Don't, don't put off salvation until it's eternally too late. Religious people are there. I mean, people who went to church every Sunday. Sang the songs of God. May have been in the choir, or even taught Sunday school. Oh, they were a good Baptist. But they were never born again. Oh, they were a good Methodist. But they were never born again. Oh, they were a good Lutheran but they were never born again. Or they were a good Catholic, but they were never born again. Look around you this morning. Look around you. You may be sitting next to someone or near someone who will be lost forever in the flames of hell. Moms and dads, look at your children. If you don't make service for God a reality in their life, they may go into eternity in hell. Hating you for their lack of love for them. They're not going to care about the toys you bought them. They're not going to care... Uh, about the spankings you never gave them. They're not going to care about the fishing trips or the ball games or the parks you visited. They're not going to care that you bought them a car or you gave them a college education. They're going to be weeping and gnashing their teeth over having parents who didn't care enough to allow them to just die and go to hell. Some parents are more concerned about their grades their children get in school than their immortal soul that's living somewhere forever. But it could be your fishing buddy. Or your friends or your, the guys you work with every day. When that day comes and they stand before God, they're not, it's not going to matter you laughed at their jokes. It's not going to matter that you bought them lunch or that you shared the six-pack of Bud Light with them after work. It's not going to matter that 
you paid for the eight ball down at the bar or that you gave them tickets to the football game. Or it could be you. You could be one of the individuals who think that, well, I cannot accept Jesus. I don't believe in all that stuff. I'll, I'll still be okay. I tell you with all the conviction in my soul and my belief in the Word of God, you will not be okay. Don't be deceived. If you do not accept the salvation that's offered through Jesus Christ, my friend, you will die and be punished for sin in hell forever. Don't think because your name's on the church roll that your name is on heaven's roll. Don't mistake the two. Well, that's the place of hell and the people of hell. Let me share with you the pardon from hell. Thank God there's a pardon. You know, the good news is you don't have to go there. It doesn't have to be your final destiny. I'd like you to look at two places. First, uh, go to Hebrews chapter 2, would you please? Hebrews chapter 2. And then we'll go back to the Gospel of John chapter 3. So you can get Hebrews 2 and then the Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, John chapter 3. And we'll look at some verses there. Here's the pardon. Notice what Hebrews 2 and verse 9. Are you there? But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that He, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. There's your pardon. Christ suffered for us. He took our place. He tasted death for every one of us. That's the wages of our sin. The torment we would have suffered in hell, Jesus suffered for us when He died on the cross. The agony we would have suffered in hell, Jesus suffered for us when He died on the cross. He tasted death for every man. I want you to notice John 3 with me, please. The Bible says, most of you know John 3.16, don't you? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that Whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. But now, don't stop there, okay? Verse 17, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. There's an important thing. You say, well, Jesus didn't come to condemn anybody. Well, why is that? Because man is already condemned. See, look at verse 18. He that believeth on Him, who's Him? Jesus Christ is not condemned. He that believeth not is what? Condemned already. Why? Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. You're already condemned. We're born into this world under condemnation. The only way that we get that condemnation lifted from us is when we say, Jesus, I believe You took my place. That I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace. But Jesus, God's Son, took my place. And He took your place. He died for you. God commended His love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
He took my place. He took your place. He died for you. That condemnation fell on Him so it doesn't have to fall on you. But if you reject Him and you reject His sacrifice for you, the condemnation stays on you. And you will die. And you will suffer for eternity in hell. The early settlers were pressing their way westward through the prairie land. They saw the prairie fire gaining on them. So they stopped and they set fire to an area of grass right where behind them. And once it had burned off, they moved their entire company on to the burnt grass. And as they stood there waiting and the fire was coming, a little boy looked up at his father and said, are you sure we won't be burned up? And the father said, son, the flames cannot reach us here. We're standing where the fire has already been. And my friend, the reason you can receive Christ as your Savior and there's no condemnation is because when you're in Jesus Christ, when you trust Him as your Savior, you're standing where the fire has already been. And it can't hurt you. A preacher worked for a glass manufacturer. He stood before one of their big furnaces staring at the flames inside. And out loud, he just said to himself, oh, what hell must be like. Unbeknownst to him, another co-worker had walked into the room and heard his comment. He was a bit startled when the following Sunday, that man was in his church. And in the invitation, he came down the aisle. And he went in front and he met him and he said, what can I help you? He said, I've come to be saved. He said, I want you to know that every time I looked at that fire in the furnace, I thought of your words. And preacher, he said, I do not want to find out what hell is like. And I don't know about you, I don't want to find it out either. I hope everybody under the sound of my voice this morning would say, I don't want to find out about it either. Well, my friend, there's a way that you don't have to ever find out about it. You don't ever have to experience it. God has provided a way. The songwriter said, I was guilty with nothing to say. And they were coming to take me away. And then a voice from heaven was heard that said, let them alone. Take me instead. That was Jesus. And that's why the songwriter said, I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace. But Jesus, God's Son, took my place. Christmas is not far away. The angels announced the birth of Jesus Christ. And when they announced His birth to the shepherds in the field, they said, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a a Savior. Savior from what? A Savior from hell. You don't have to die and go to hell. God sent a Savior. But if you reject the Savior, If you turn on the Savior, you say, I don't need that stuff. You're going to go to hell, my friend. I don't don't like that. But it's the truth. It's the truth. If the hurricane was coming, I'd warn you. If your house was on fire, I'd yell and scream and warn you to get out. And I have no way of knowing when God puts the message on my heart to what to preach on a Sunday. Listen to me. I have no way of knowing who's going to be in church on Sunday. I had no idea the visitors that would be here. I had no idea who's going to be in attendance, who's going to miss, who's going to be out of town, who's going to be in town. I have no way of knowing that. There's only one person who knows that. And that's God. And so when God lays this message on my heart to preach on this Sunday morning, He knew who was going to be here. 
He knew who needed to hear the message. Don't turn them off. Don't, don't sit there and say, oh, yeah, another one of those hellfire and brimstone. No. God said, God knew you needed to hear a message about hell. Now listen. Let me close with this. Those of you who are saved, those of you who know Christ as your Savior, the request of that man in hell was to send Lazarus to my father's house because I've got five brothers lest they come to this place of torment. Don't let the commercials fool you. Nobody's having a good time in hell. The devil's not walking around in a red suit with a pitchfork. That's the world and the devil trying to deceive people into thinking it's no big deal. It's a big deal. He said, I, nobody who's in hell wants anyone else to come there. And his cry was, oh, send somebody to my... Let him testify. Please, go warn him not to come to this place of torment. I wonder if people in hell are crying out for you and me to go talk to those neighbors. To talk to the people we're working with. To talk to their loved ones that are still here crying out for us to tell them, warn them, don't go to this place of torment. You could, you could answer the prayer of someone in hell by witnessing, by giving the gospel to every creature. Hell. If you're here this morning and you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, I'm not saying that there's a time, listen to me carefully, I'm not, I'm not asking you that, yeah, you know, when I was seven or eight years old, I went to Bible school and I said a prayer. And, but you don't care about God. You don't care about the things of God. You don't care about the Word of God. You don't care about the people of God. You don't care about the church of God. You're fooling yourself. Don't do that. When Jesus Christ said, "Straight is the way and narrow is the gate that narrow is the way and straight is the gate that leads to life, and few there be that find it, and broad is the way and wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat," tells me there's a lot of folks who believe they're going to heaven that aren't going. There's only one way to be sure: accept the pardon that's in Jesus Christ. And it's not hard. That's the great news. All the work's been done. Jesus already did all the work. He said the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's a gift. You just have to be willing to receive it. Say, I can't do anything to pardon myself. I can't do anything to save myself. I'll accept what Jesus has done for me. And I'll receive Him as my Savior. My urge you this morning, accept the pardon. Let's pray together. Shall we, Father, take the truth now this morning? Lord, I pray that You'll work in people's hearts. Do, Holy Spirit, what only You can do now in these few minutes. I, I believe You've been at work. Lord, I do not know everybody in this room. And I certainly do not profess to know the heart of anybody in this room including my own. But I believe you know everyone, everyone's heart. And you know everyone that's here today. And I'm asking you, God, that you would help those who have never received Christ as their Savior, that they would not play games with eternity. That they would not boast themselves of tomorrow, for they know not what a day can bring forth. Help them to accept the pardon this morning. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.
I'm going to finish praying in just a moment. But I wonder this morning how many people in the room would say, Pastor, if I died this morning, I know 100% sure I'd go to heaven. Pastor, I've accepted the pardon of Jesus Christ. His death on the cross for me. And if someone asks me, what am I trusting in into heaven? I would say I'm trusting in Jesus Christ as my Savior. Pastor, I know that I'm saved. Here's my hand as a testimony. Would you slip it up for a moment that I may see it today? I know that I'm saved. All right, you may put it down. You're here today and would say, Pastor, I, I can't raise my hand. In all honesty, I can't raise my hand and say I'm sure about that. Would you let me pray for you? Now, I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to embarrass you, but I will pray for you. I'm, th I'm thankful that you're concerned about your soul. Would you slip your hand up this morning and say, Pastor, I'm not certain about heaven and I don't want to go to hell. Pastor, pray for me this morning. Would you slip your hand up? God bless you. Thank you. Somebody else today? Slip yours up. Say, Pastor, pray for me. Say, oh, what? Everybody, everybody, I, I'm a church member. Everybody thinks I'm saved. I wouldn't go to hell with that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to hell and think, whoa, oh, in all eternity, all you'll think about is, oh, I was so worried about what other people would think. Be more concerned with what God knows. Say, Pastor, pray for me this morning. Anybody else would join these? Some of you couldn't raise your hand either time. I'm praying for you. How many believers here today would say, Preacher, I needed the reminder that folks die and go to hell. And I need to be conscious that when I see them, they're going to spend eternity somewhere. And I need to be a better witness for Jesus Christ than what I have been. Preacher, the Lord has spoken to my heart this morning. Would you slip your hand up, Christian? Yes. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may put them down. In a moment, I'm going to pray. Listen carefully. If you're here this morning, you're not sure that you have eternal life. You're not sure you ever accepted that pardon from hell. In a moment I'll pray. We'll stand to our feet. The pianist will play by the Bible sing. Christians will be coming to the altar just to pray. Praying for loved ones. Praying for children. Praying for their relatives. Praying for God to save them. You slip out and come. I'll meet you here at the front. We have people who have been trained. They'll take a Bible. They'll show you how you can receive the pardon from hell and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Don't listen to the devil saying, put it off, not now. Don't listen to that. Do it today. Do it today. You'll be glad you did. If you're here today and you're saved and you've never been scripturally baptized, you ought to say, Pastor, I need to obey the Lord and be baptized. If you're saved and you're scripturally baptized and you say, you know what, Pastor, this is where we believe God wants us to belong. We want to belong to this church and serve the Lord here. Then you come and say, Pastor, we're saved, we're baptized, we want to belong here. We'd be glad to welcome you into the fellowship of our church. Whatever it is that God's dealing with your heart about today, obey Him this morning. Father, thank You for speaking to our hearts. Thank You, Lord, for hands that have been uplifted indicating that people are sensitive and the Spirit of God has dealt with them this morning. I pray for those who are unsure of heaven, that God, You would release them from the grip of Satan this morning and receive them. Help them to walk out the doors as a child of God, knowing their name is written down in heaven. Have your way, please, in this invitation. May every single individual do as you're bidding them to do in their heart. And I'll thank you for it.